I want to start by expressing my appreciation again to the elders for asking me to come and be uh, with you all this week. It has been a joy. It's been a blessing and a privilege for me. I appreciate so very much your attention, your comments, your hospitality. Uh, this has been, it's been good for me. It's been helpful for me. Uh, it's been healing for me. So uh, thank you all for what you've done for me this week. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I love this church, and uh, I love what you stand for. I, I love what you are. Uh, I love what you're producing because I've seen your children and your grandchildren. Uh, I've had a, just a tremendous privilege to be able to work with some of them, uh, and uh, I know that they've been well taught, and uh, they are spiritually minded, and, and, and we just appreciate so much. You know, and I, I will be praying for you and for the work that you all are doing uh, as we go forward in the future. Uh, I've been preaching for a little over 40 years all the time. I've been, been preaching for a long time before I started to just preach, devote myself to full-time work of preaching the gospel. Uh, and during, during that time uh, in, in preaching and teaching Bible classes, Bible classes at the church building and Bible classes with uh, individuals and small groups, uh, w one thing that I have never gotten completely comfortable with, uh, and I don't know how the other preachers in the audience feel about this, but I have never been completely comfortable with what we traditionally do at the close of every service like this, and that is to extend the invitation. Uh, and, and, and the reason is because lots of times sermons really don't lend themselves to an invitation, and so what you have to do is you have to develop kind of a, a, a feel for being able to end the sermon, having said what you wanted to say, and now turn our attention in a little bit different direction to inviting people to respond to the invitation. An invitation song is traditionally sung, and we give people an opportunity to either become Christians or to come back into a right relationship with God if that's what they need to do. As a matter of fact, that, that, that became so intriguing to me that we do that, and, and we do it everywhere. I mean, at least in this country. Uh, just every place I've ever been, a service like this will end with offering the invitation and singing the invitation song. So I did a little historical research. Uh, and, and what I discovered is, and, and actually you can take it all the way back to the first century, to the New Testament, but... Uh, traditionally, historically, uh, ser sermons, services like this didn't always end that way. Uh, so, so where did ending a sermon with an invitation, when, when did that really become just the, the, the way to do things? And really, you can trace it back to a period of time in Europe and the United States that was called the Great Awakening. Uh, it was a religious revival. It started in the 1770s, 1780s. And, and swept Europe, and then uh, preachers who were having success in preaching in Europe came to the United States, and they began preaching, and uh, large numbers of people were converted. They had a, a, a great awakening revival up in a little town called, just uh, outside of a little town called Paris, Kentucky. Uh, some, some of you all know where Paris, Kentucky is, uh, and there's a place outside of Paris called Cane Ridge. Uh, and and uh, during the two weeks that, that this revival was going on, estimate, crowd estimates are 25,000 people. And we're talking 1807, 1809, somewhere. 25,000 people who walked to get there, who rode horses and mules to get there, uh, who rode on the back of wagons to get there. And, and, and it was during that period of time in these revivals when this enthusiasm for religion was beginning to spread again, that the men who were doing the preaching would end their services with what became known as the altar call. Inviting people, you've heard the gospel preached, inviting people now to come and respond. And, and so it's just been done that way pretty much ever since then. Uh, and and it, it doesn't bother me at all. I've used the word tradition or some form of it a couple of times. It doesn't bother me at all. To use that word, it is what we do by ending a service like this with offering the invitation. Is very, it's very much, a, it's our tradition. There is no biblical pattern per se for ending a sermon, ending a service like this by offering the invitation. Now, 
You know, and, and as a matter of fact, look look at the sermons in the New Testament. How how did how did Peter end the sermon that he preached in Acts chapter two? Uh, he, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. <laughs> and basically, he stopped. And they are the ones then, some of them are the ones who came to Peter and the other apostles and said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter tells them. Uh, and so you had, you had people, they already believed that Jesus was the Son of God. They've already confessed that they believe that Jesus is the Son of God. When they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? They, they were saying, Peter, we believe what you just said, that we crucified the Son of God. And, and, and by the way, wouldn't that have been a perfect time if people in the denominational world who, who believe that we're saved by faith only, wouldn't that have been a perfect time for Peter just to say, well, you don't have to do anything else. You're already saved. You already have faith. But he doesn't say that, does he? He says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. Now, having said all of that, let me say this, that I'm not opposed to extending an invitation. And inviting people to respond to the invitation of the gospel is very biblical. And so you have Jesus, for example, in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28 saying, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You have Peter will even go on in Acts chapter 2 and verse 40 to say to those people, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. And then, of course, Ananias, the preacher, the gospel preacher Ananias, goes to Saul of Tarsus, who is in the city of Damascus. He's blind, having seen the vision of Jesus. And Ananias goes and he preaches the gospel to him. And Ananias, at the end of that, says, and, and he had to have spoken it in Shakespearean King James English, right? I mean, it just doesn't sound right if Ananias is not saying, Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Well, the English Standard Version just says, and now why do you wait? <laughs> why tarriest thou? Has a lot more power, right? And so it is biblical to offer an invitation. What I'm suggesting to you, though, is the way we do it. We tack the invitation onto the end of the sermon is, is, is very much a 18th, 19th, 20th century traditional way of doing things. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with just leaving it alone and doing that. Uh, and, and continuing to do that. Uh, it, it is important, I think, that we take advantage of opportunities to invite people to obey the gospel. But, I, but I've been in gospel meetings where we did it differently. I did a meeting, um, as a matter of fact, I've held several meetings in a little town just south of Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, and, and in those meetings, we'll have three services on Sunday. And then usually the meetings I've held there will be Monday through Friday night. And Monday through Friday night, we, we, they get up and they make the announcements like we all do here. And then they had me get up and offer the invitation. And so I would do that. And then we would sing an invitation song. And if somebody responded, they would take care of it. And if nobody did, we would sit down. Okay, and now we're going to sing. And then Gary's going to preach. And anything? Well, I see some puzzled looks on people's faces. But, but can you think of any, anything biblically wrong with that? It's just a different way of doing exactly the same thing, is it not? As a matter of fact, I kind of liked it, again, because some of my lessons, as a matter of fact, I think probably most of my lessons, unless I have designed a lesson specifically for those who are not Christians, and that amounts to a very small percentage of my preaching. I'm generally preaching to a group like this that is composed predominantly of people who are already Christians. And so I'm going to design something to say, to try to be of a benefit to those who are Christians, and then we have to stop and, okay, now we're going to change gears and we're going to invite people to respond to the gospel. And that's the title of the lesson tonight, is The Invitation and Responses to the Gospel. And really the title of the lesson is Responses at Every Service. So, sometimes I think we judge the success and failure of preaching based upon what we perceive to be responses to the invitation, responses to the gospel. It doesn't, it doesn't happen at East Side. The, the brethren will not ask me uh, when I see them tomorrow and Friday and Saturday and Sunday. The brethren will not say, well, they will say, how was the meeting? But they will not say, how many responses did you have? 
uh, as though they were asking, did anybody come forward and ask to be baptized? Did anybody come forward and confess sin? They won't be asking that. Uh, they're well trained. <laughs> now, they might very well ask, how did you eat? What, was it a two-pound meeting? You know, was it a three-pound meeting? Sometimes they can just look at me and tell, oh, it was a good meeting. I see it was a good meeting. <laughs> it was a good meeting. But it, 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 I, I think it's, you know, kind of, kind of like sports teams, maybe, sports teams. Uh, you know, the, the, the team doesn't live up to expectations. Generally speaking, who gets the blame? You know, well, the, the manager does. So we don't, you know, the, you, have, you have a gospel preacher and you're supporting him on a local level and you go for a while and you don't have any, nobody comes forward during the invitation and people start thinking, well, we need to find another preacher. Something's wrong with the preacher. We have a gospel meeting. And we don't get any responses to the invitation, and some might be tempted to think, well, it wasn't a successful meeting. Uh, and so, with, with the help of some preaching brethren of mine, and, and talking about this and kind of batting some of these ideas around, uh, we, we came up with this idea that, that is helpful, I think, if we understand that every time the gospel is preached, there are responses. Every time the gospel is preached, there are responses. Uh, as a matter of fact, I would even, I, 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 I'll take it all the way. I would say, it, uh, to, tonight I'm going to make every effort to preach the gospel, uh, to encourage people. We've been trying to do that all week. When I finish here in a few minutes, every accountable person in this audience will respond to the gospel. The, the, the question becomes, well, what do we mean by responses at every service? What, what are the ways that people respond? So I'm, I'm going to put the best one first, or at least one of the best ones first. I'll start with a good one and end with a good one. I mean, th th this is really what, what every preacher prays for. This is what every preacher works for. And that is that some people will respond by making the personal, private decision to improve their spiritual lives. And, and might I suggest to you that that is a response to the gospel? If somebody or some buddies in the audience hear a lesson and they think, I needed that, that's helpful to me. I need to make some changes. I need to be stronger. I need to be better. I need to be more faithful. I need to be more active. I need to do more work. And, and you might, the, the preacher, the other members, you, you might never hear anything about that. And as a matter of fact, I would suggest to you that probably most of the time you don't. I, I really, I, I'm, I'm one of those people who needs positive affirmation. I really appreciate when you come by and you shake my hand and you tell me what a good lesson it was. Um, but, but I know that that's, you know, again, that's, that's kind of a traditional thing we say. And I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And I, and I hope you mean it. I wonder sometimes when I notice that, you know, this guy has slept through the whole sermon and he comes by and tells me what a good lesson it was, then I'm really wondering... <laughs> well, you, you never know what somebody might hear in their sleep, I suppose. But, but really, what, what we hope for, those of us who preach the gospel, and we pray about this, and, and it's, it's why we spend so much time in our studies. It's why we spend so much time in the Word of God. How can I say what needs to be said from God's Word in such a way that it will motivate people to be better than they were before they heard the lesson? And those victories are vital. Those victories are important. And I really think that happens, for the most part, I think that happens every time the gospel is preached. It, it doesn't depend on the oratorical skills of the one delivering the message. It doesn't depend on the humor or the illustrations that are used to try to, to, try to boister the point or build up the point. If the truth is being preached, and people are listening intently, and they make that private determination in their mind, I'm going to do better. That is a response to the gospel. I really, I really hope that happens every time. And, and I'm maybe a little naive, but I'm naive enough to believe that it does. That every time the gospel is preached, some respond by making a determination to make the change. But you know, sometimes people get angry with the preacher it has always been tempting to blame the messenger, has it not? The Apostle Paul was concerned about that, and, and he, he writes a letter to the churches of Galatia. Uh, and and it, it's, it's not a pleasant letter. It is not Philippians by any stretch of the imagination. 
Uh, he, he starts out in the very beginning by telling them, if, if, if we are an angel from heaven, preach any, any other gospel to you than that which you have heard from us, let them be accursed. He's dealing with a serious problem in the churches of Galatia, the problem of the Judaizing teachers. And, and Paul becomes very concerned about how they are going to receive this message. So he says, and I would almost guarantee you that every preacher I've ever known has this verse circled or highlighted, highlighted or starred in their New Testament. He says in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 16, Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? And Paul was concerned about that. And, 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 and I will tell you that I am too. And every preacher I have ever known on an intimate level. Every, every preacher th that I've ever had a close enough relationship where I could really get to know them as people feels exactly the same way. We do not mount the pulpit to make enemies of people. We do not mount the pulpit to intentionally offend anyone. The gospel is offensive enough without a human being adding an offensive presentation or offensive remarks. The gospel was intended to offend. It's interesting that you have two diametrically opposed responses to the gospel early in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, Peter says to those people, you killed the Son of God. You killed, you killed him. And, it, and the text says, Luke says that they were cut to the heart. And, 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 and when they were cut to the heart... They, that's when they asked Peter and the other apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter told them, and 3,000 people were baptized. Well, a few, a few years later, Stephen is preaching basically to the same people. And Luke says that when Stephen got to the end of his message, those people were cut to the heart. Well, what did they do? They picked up rocks and threw them at the preacher. I am blessed to say that no one has ever thrown anything at me in the pulpit. <laughs> I did preach a lesson one time over in Cumberland County, Kentucky, and Cumberland County is a unique place. I have lots of kinfolk there. <laughs> and during the lesson, I was preaching on the conversion of the man from Ethiopia in Acts chapter 8, and I got to, got to, got to the point where uh, the man from Ethiopia says, see, here's water, what's keeping me from being baptized. And he and Philip go down into the water and baptize him. While I was making that point, about halfway back in the auditorium, I noticed a man, and he was wearing coveralls, which, which was perfectly fine. They were clean. They were his, you know, go-to-meeting coveralls. And, uh, but I could see by the look on his face that he wasn't happy, and he stood up, and he, and he stood there for just a second, staring at me, and then he walked out. And I thought, well, okay. <laughs> I was fine until the brethren told me after the lesson was over that he was waiting for me in the parking lot. <laughs> I, I hung around the building for a long time that night. I tried to find cousins who were, you know, big, bulky, farmer-type guys that I could walk at. Right, by the time I got out, they had diffused the situation and he was gone. I suspect if I had gone straight out, though, there would have been a confrontation maybe. Uh, he, 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 that, that, that's, that's the only time that that's ever happened to me. But, but I've had brethren get upset with me for things that I've preached. Uh, and, and, you know, may, maybe they got upset because I wasn't very careful in how I presented it. And, and I'm human, and, and I make mistakes. Maybe I'd not been very kind in the way that I'd said it. Uh, maybe I had, you know, overemphasized or overstrayed. Pre preachers use hyperbole, exaggeration sometimes to make, to make their points. Maybe I did that, but, but a lot of times in my experience, what, rather than get mad, it, it's not because of any of those things. It's because you've taught the truth, and it hurts. They, they were cut to the heart. And might I suggest to you that that's exactly what God intended the gospel message to do, was prick people's hearts. And, and the only question is, how will you respond to your heart being pricked? Will you, like the Pentecostians, humbly admit that Peter was right and try to find out what can I do to fix it? What can I do to make it right? Or will you, like the scribes and the Pharisees in Acts chapter 7, will you pick up rocks, literally I and mean, figuratively I mean, symbolically, hopefully, not literally, <laughs> and start throwing them at the preacher? Will, will you get angry? Now, sometimes the truth hurts. 
And that is a response. And it, it, it's, again, I don't, I don't know any preacher. Maybe there are preachers who intentionally try to get people angry, but, but I, I've never known them. I, 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 I know it happens sometimes, but I, it, I, I don't intend ever go into the pulpit with the intention. I, I really hope I, I get under these people's skin. I really hope I get them angry. But that's, that's the gospel. F- foolishness to some. But that's the gospel. Some people respond by, I hope that's not the case this week. And I certainly hope that's not the case tonight. Some, some respond by just ignoring the teaching. This, this, this is really sad. Uh, and and it, it, it doesn't happen a lot. But, but sometimes it happens that pe- people just ignore the truth. They, they hear it. Uh, they understand it. They, they know exactly what is required of them. But they just ignore it. They don't respond to it in a positive way. They don't respond to it in the way that God intended for them to do. I've known of a situation many times down through the years where where somebody would come. It's impressive how often this is a man. uh, And and, and he will come, and his wife is a Christian, and he's not. And he, he will not only bring her, but he will come with her. And he will sit and listen to the preaching over and over and over again. It's not a question of not knowing what to do. It's not a question of not knowing what the truth is and then get up at the end of the services and just walk out without doing anything about it. And you know, the scary thing about that is every time you do that, your conscience gets a little bit harder. You know, every, every time you ignore doing what you know must be done to be in a right relationship with God or to come back into a right relationship with God, the next time it will be easier, and the next time it will be easier. And as a matter of fact, I, I believe the New Testament teaches that our consciences can get so hard that it will be impossible for the gospel to touch us any longer. And so ignoring the, the, the message is, is not a safe, it's not a good option, but, but some people do. And that is a response. That I'm, I'm, not going to, I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to do what I know I need to do. So, some people will respond by acting immaturely, quibbling, arguing with the preacher, laughing and talking during the lesson, clipping nails, sleeping. I have a whole list of things here. Writing notes, uh, playing games on handheld devices. That I, have, I had to add that recently, <laughs> recently to the list. And that, that happens sometimes. And, and, and it's not just the children Sometimes it's the, that's what I mean when I talk about a few will respond by acting immaturely. Uh, we have lots of babies at, at Eastside, and, and we have more, more coming. Uh, and and I, say, I say this a lot. Uh, I say it publicly a lot. Bring the babies to church. And, and if they fuss, if they cry, if, if they get loud, if these babies get loud, no problem. That doesn't bother me at all. I can talk louder. Uh, now, if they all gang up on me at one time, I'm gonna, uh, even I'm going to be in trouble. But that very seldom ever happens. It, it doesn't bother me to see children being children. It honestly doesn't. But it bothers me a lot seeing teenagers be children. It bothers me a lot watching young adults act like children, and sometimes that happens. And, and you're standing in the pulpit and you're thinking, I have worked so hard. I have put so many hours into this. How am I going to say this? What is the most effective way to say it? What is the way to say it that will be, be the most likely to attract people's attention? And then to know that sometimes in the audience there are people who are doing other things and acting immaturely. Again, that doesn't happen very often, but it happens sometimes. Some, sometimes, and, and, and this, this is why those of us who preach lose sleep. Uh, th- th- this, is wh- this is why those of us who preach lose hair. <laughs> uh, th- this is why those of us who preach have usually higher blood pressure and stress levels than, uh, along with elders, uh, more so than maybe other people do, is that sometimes... People's response is just no, I will not obey the gospel. I will not obey the gospel. Or I will not confess my faults, my public faults, 
to those against, uh, uh, the, those against whom I have sinned. I will not acknowledge sins and bringing shame and reproach upon the church. I will not admit that. No is, is, is a response. It's, it's, it's not the desired response. It, it, it is amazing to me that 3,000 people were baptized on that very first day of Pentecost, but... I mean, you know, and, and that is, that, that is outstanding. It's hard to imagine even how they could baptize 3,000 people in one day, but, but they did. But if Josephus is right, Josephus was a Jewish historian, jo Josephus suggests that on any given Passover-Pentecost, se seven weeks and a day later, that there were, there were anywhere from one and a half to three million Jews in the city of Jerusalem for those feasts. So 3,000 people responded. It's likely that 20 or 30 or 40,000 Jews heard the same message and said no. And we don't think about that sometimes. We, we, we get lost in the euphoria Rightly so, of 3,000 people being baptized, Luke intended for us to be impressed by that because he tells us that by inspiration. But think about all of the people who didn't respond. As a matter of fact, I've heard people say down through the years that the book of Acts is a study of cases of conversion. Well, there are cases of conversion in the book of Acts, but I don't know if you've ever noticed this or not, but there are just as many cases of non-conversion in the book of Acts as there are conversion. The vast majority of people who heard the preaching of the gospel in the book of Acts said no. Only a small percentage said yes. And you know what? That hasn't changed in 3,000 years. Uh, who, who, wouldn't, who wouldn't love to be a part of a local church where dozens of people a month were responding to the invitation, where, where somebody was baptized every week, somebody is restored every week, that, that we just have a constant flow of conversions. But I don't know of any local church where that's happening. I don't know of any local church any place in the world where that's happening. It's still true that the gospel is offensive. It always has been. And the vast majority, unfortunately, the vast majority of people who hear the gospel preached end up saying no. It, it is entirely possible that there's somebody here tonight who needs to become a Christian. And when it's time, when the opportunity is given you to obey the gospel, you will just say no. It is possible that there's someone here who needs to acknowledge public sin and ask for forgiveness and ask for encouragement and ask for support. And when the time comes for you to make that decision and do that, your response will be no. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. Now, I had a, had a relationship with two elders one time, a long time ago, many years ago in another state, just so your minds don't go wandering. And, and these, these two elders believed that pre preaching, the, the, the preaching should be treated like running, a, the work of the local church should be treated like running a small business. And, and, and so the, the preacher is our salesman. And, and he's making a sales pitch to 100 people twice a week to 100 people. And you go, you go six months and nobody purchases the product. How long, how long are you going to keep a salesman like that around? And so basically, they, they went through a parade over a period of years of preacher after preacher after preacher because it, it never got through their heads. I started to say something more, but I caught myself. <laughs> and it never became clear to them that, that that's not how the gospel works. Sometimes people will hear the gospel and say no. As a matter of fact, most of the people who hear the gospel message are going to say no. And that was true in the first century, and it's been true ever since then. We're looking for those few. Remember, wasn't that the Marine Corps motto for a while? We're looking for a few good, and they couldn't say men anymore, so they had to change it to people, I think, eventually. But we're looking for a few good people. Well, that's, that's, what pre that's what preachers are doing. That's what elders in local churches are doing. We're looking for those few good and honest hearts who will ultimately respond by rendering obedience to the gospel. And I promise you they're still out there. 
even in this postmodern, progressive, ungodly world in which we live, there are still people out there whose hearts will be pricked in the right way. They're looking for the truth. They're waiting for someone to show them what they need to do to be saved. And I, I, I will tell you again, what, what every preacher I know, that this, this is what you live for. Finding those few good people whose hearts are touched with the power of the gospel in the right way. We, we all hope, I, I do, Every preacher I know, we, we all desperately hope that you will forgive us when we overstate our case, that, that you will forgive us when, when, when we sound unkind or, or when we sound mean-spirited. It's not our intention at all. We're, we're, we're trying to find those few good and honest hearts. And, and so, have, have we had responses in the Northside meeting this week? Yeah. yeah. I think we have at every service. And, and I think we will tonight. I, I, I would challenge you to, to, to look at this. I'll leave it up there for another, another second or two. I would challenge you to look at this. You are going right now to respond to the gospel in one of these ways. And, and, and the decision is yours. I, I, I wouldn't let it be your decision if I could help it. If I could be baptized for you, I, I would do it in a heartbeat. I'd probably have to get in line behind other people who would do it too. If I could confess your sins to God and ask God to forgive you and count on God forgiving you of your sins because of my prayer, I would be on my knees constantly. I, I, would, I would gladly do that for you. And, and again, I'd have to get in line behind so many other people who love you and want you to be in a right relationship with God. But, but it's not up to us. We, we can't obey the gospel for you. It's got to be your decision. You're either going to ignore it or you're going to say no or you're going to say yes. I want to become a Christian. I want to be baptized into Christ for the remission of my sins. Or I already am a Christian, but I've sinned and I've asked God to forgive me of my sin and I want the brethren to know that and I want them to pray for me and encourage me and help me to do better in the future than I've done in the past. You can say yes to the gospel invitation. We're going to do what we traditionally do. We're going to sing a song. And the words to these songs are generally designed to get you to think about your spiritual condition. And if you're ready to say yes to God's invitation, we would be thrilled to help you do that in any way that we can. Let us know how we might help you by coming down to one of these front seats right now while we stand and while we sing.